morning, everyone. My name is Rick Santos, and on behalf of my company, Santos Knight Frank, I am pleased to welcome you to today's webinar session about the impact of COVID-19 on the real estate sector. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge our partners and speakers today. Uh, our event partner, the Urban Land Institute of the Philippines, represented by Jean De Castro, who has recently been appointed as a national chair, as one of the pioneers of, of, of ULI with Charlie Rufino and others, it's great to see such quality people now leading the Urban Land Institute in the Philippines. We also have Kuruvilla Abraham, uh, who's a senior executive director for property management of Knight Frank in Malaysia, looking after PM and FM and asset management. We refer to him as Kuru the Guru, because he knows so much about the management sector. We also have Nestor Correa, who is the president of the Philippine Institute of Real Estate Property Managers and Administrator. FIRMA is a fantastic organization. It's also our event partner. Thank you, Nestor, for joining us. We also have, uh, want to thank Ed Macalental, uh, who is our uh, head of property management for Santos Knight Frank. We have Edwin Samarista here on the business development side, director, and also Maureen Garcia, also on the business development side. Uh, from our property management team. And thank you, all of you, for helping to bring this all together. Uh, welcome also to our, our guests and friends from Malaysia who are tuning in, and also all of the guests from around the world. I'm very grateful that you have been joining us this morning and also for our previous webinars. By way of introduction, Santos Knight Frank is the leading full-service real estate advisory company in the Philippines. We founded the company back in 1994. And we provide the full range of real estate services, including a comprehensive suite of services for landlords, property owners, developers, and investors. Uh, landlord representation is a key business. We are representing the owners of many of the most prestigious buildings across the country. Investment capital markets, our investment team has driven some of the most complex deals in the country, including cross-border transactions, including equity and debt financing. Valuations were fully licensed by the SEC, PS, PSE, BSB to perform a wide-ranging valuation services across multiple asset classes, including plant and machinery, and also including real estate investment trust, which we have a lot of experience in. We've done work with a number of the groups in, in Hong Kong and Singapore in the region as well. Research and consultancy world market leader, property management, we're managing more than 200 million square feet of property across the country. I think we're the largest international group here doing that. Property management, we do fit out, base building consultancy, lenders technical, advisor, lenders technical advisory, and QS. Technical services engineering, we're serving the engineering needs of our clients from maintenance of key assets to the importation, installation of large scale industrial machinery, aircon, et cetera. So strong, wide-ranging platform. Our global reach for Knight Frank spans 60 territories, more than 500 offices worldwide, covering the US, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia Pacific. Over the last seven webinars, we've tackled a range of topics that included return to work strategy, the hospitality sector, which is uh, getting hit hard while helping owners find a way out of that, industrial logistics, which is, we're seeing some green shoots there, co-living, uh, the multifamily adult BPO is, is adult co-living is, is another green shoot sector uh, and many more. Uh, we've attracted more than 30,000 attendees at our last webinars and thanks again for joining us. Today we turn the spotlight to really the unsung heroes of real estate and people behind resilient buildings. It's really the property and facilities management professionals. My team, Santos Knight Frank, manages over 200 million square feet of space across the entire Philippines and I've never been prouder of each and every one of our property management team members. They are the first line of defense in keeping tenants, owners, and properties safe during this pandemic. Today, we're gonna to hear about property management from the perspectives of both the Philippines and also Malaysia. We look at how these markets have addressed the challenge of the pandemic and how property management practices will evolve as a result of COVID-19. And I think on this call as well, we wanna get people back into the office back working because at what we're starting to realize is the work from home doesn't work. We look at the Gini coefficient, you find out that work from home might work if you're wealthy in one of the, one of, one of the uh, uh, industrialized markets, but as you go into the emerging markets, and even if you're in the top 1%, you're still gonna have trouble with your internet connection. So let's get people back into the office safely, efficiently, let's look after our buildings. Um, so to get us started, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Gene DeCastro, 
the dynamic new national chair of ULI in the Philippines. Gene DeCastro is the CEO of ESCA Inc., a full-service Filipino engineering consultancy recognized for championing new technologies such as building information management, advancing digital transformation engineering design and construction. She's a trained arbitrator and experienced litigator. Earlier in her career, Jean worked with Bloomberg TV in the Philippines as a business news anchor for programs that focus on the real estate sector. Jean, congratulations on your new role. Over to you. Should I mute? Yeah. Thank you very much, Rick. I hope everyone can hear me now. Hi, yeah, everyone. Yeah. Good morning. I apologize for that. Good morning to everyone online. I'm glad to see friends joining us from Malaysia and around the world, you know, the advantages of a connected world. We are always grateful to Santos Knight Frank uh, for being a great partner to ULI um, for the past few years and now collaborating on this very important and timely topic, you now property management best practices in Southeast Asia. And Rick, it was great you showed the faces, right, of these unsung heroes. To share about who we are, Urban Land Institute is an international membership-based nonprofit research and education organization. We have 45,000 members across the 76 countries. We represent different professionals across the real estate industry. You've got developers, owners, architects, property managers, urban planners, and even academics. So peer-to-peer -peer learning and knowledge-based sharing across a local, a locally and globally is really at the heart of our mission, ULI's mission to create better places and thriving and sustainable communities. So even before the pandemic, we really saw how property management has shifted, right? From what used to be just providing space or four walls and a ceiling to providing a customer experience. So that is being accelerated now as the market shifts and responds to COVID-19 and also is also being redefined by the bigger demand now on health, sanitation, and safety. So technology is also giving property management a shot in the arm where customer experience is now a combination of both the physical and digital realm. Um, in ULI, we like to talk about placemaking. That's connecting the tangible or the real estate with the intangible or the human um, connectedness. And that's where property management comes in and becomes even more important during this time. So in the Philippines, we have recently reverted to a stricter lockdown after a few weeks of being able to go back to offices again. So what is crucial now is, you know, making tenants regain that confidence and property managers being able to address that you know, safety first um, need of customers at, at this time. So that's what uh, places property managers at a very uh, important time uh, where, you know, it's faced with its own set of challenges in providing a human touch in a contactless world, right? So we are navigating this new world together. There's no set playbook. Just so just like you, I'm very eager to hear from our speakers now from the Philippines and from Malaysia to share their experiences and for us to take away best practices in property management for business continuity and to allow us, our tenants, residents of commercial and residential properties to successfully travel this road together and move forward. So thank you very much for having me here. Back to you, Rick. Thank you, Jean, and uh, thank you for those uh, these opening comments. And once again, congratulations on your new role as head of the ULI Urban Land Institute in the Philippines, succeeding uh, Bud Wenceslau, who, who's, uh, who did a great job. Uh, uh, basically, um, uh, we want to provide a Philippine overview of the property management in terms of response to COVID-19. Therefore, I'm very pleased to introduce Ed Maclintal, the head of Santos Knight Frank's Knight property man Frank. management team. Ed is in charge of the property management operation of various vertical and horizontal properties ranging from residential and office buildings to resorts and luxury residential villages in Metro Manila, including Calabrazon, Avao, among other locations. He brings with him over 20 years of property management experience gained from leading developers uh, in the Philippines and abroad. Ed, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction, Rick, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to share with you uh, the measures that we've taken up uh, 
you know, and to sustain operations uh, here in uh, uh, during the pandemic here in the Philippines. Uh, slide, please. Okay, so uh, in the previous uh, SKF webinars, uh, Rick talked about uh, CPR, you know, which uh, what we need uh, for the real estate industry uh, to sustain its operations. Uh, we use the same acronym also in property management, but this time in the CPR means uh, communication, preparation, and resources. So uh, under communication, uh, uh, it's, it is uh, very important, it's very critical that we uh, uh, communicate and coordinate with the local government, um, with the uh, barangays uh, and also the IADF, as to the, uh, as to the uh, policies and guidelines uh, on how we will act uh, into this uh, uh, pan pandemic situation and how we will be able to respond, uh, especially to uh, all those uh, COVID positive cases in our communities. And it is also very important that we also uh, communicate and coordinate with uh, the building owners, the residents, um, the developers, and uh, so that uh, they will be updated also on our plans on how we will be able to mitigate the risk of a COVID infection uh, in, our, in our properties we are managing. Um, we are managing um, almost all kinds of properties from uh, commercial, residential, um, um, subdivisions. Uh, so it's very critical for us to really uh, inform and um, uh, our unit owners, our residents, on what are the plans uh, uh, on how we will be able to mitigate this, uh, this uh, risk of infection. And then, uh, again, um, the importance of uh, being in the... Uh, in coordination with the service providers, so the, um, the security, the housekeeping, the technical staff, so that um, they can work um, uh, in synergy uh, and be able to make sure that the unit owners uh, uh, would feel that uh, everything is being taken care of uh, in the properties. And then, of course, we'll go down to our preparation. Uh, before the pandemic, we have all these kinds of uh, plans. Um, emergency and disaster plans, which covers almost everything, uh, from the volcanic eruptions uh, to um, typhoons, earthquakes, and even demonstrations. However, uh, we don't have uh, the business continuity plan for pandemic. So what we did is we uh, uh, review and revise uh, our, uh, our business continuity plan to include uh, 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 the BCP for the health pandemics. So it's a continuing process. So we really have to you know, review uh, every now and then, or just to make sure that everything will fit in and will suit it on for the, uh, you know, for the uh, pandemics. And then uh, we also have this uh, uh, COVID safety protocol plan that that uh, we are now implementing uh, to all sites, and um, also the reoccupancy plan, which later I will also uh, discuss it to you. And then uh, resources. Um, we uh, recommend, uh, recommend the uh, continuation of collection of sources in juice and utilities payments, simply because in this kind of situation, in this kind of disruption, um, cash is king. So uh, um, uh, there should be a continuity of operations uh, on all the managed properties. Uh, but when it comes to the um, um, uh, waiving of penalties and interest, no, so we coordinated also with the continuing corporations and the board of directors uh, for approval. Uh, if it, uh, they, they're going to approve uh, the, um, the the waiving of such penalties and interest. Uh. And then for logistics, uh, Santos Knight Frank uh, Corporate, we provided um, a shuttle services for all our staff, those who are having a difficult time. Uh, uh, going to the office because of the ECQ. And also we assisted them, uh, the site people, uh, the site staff, for the issuance of the um, of, uh, of uh, checkpoint passes so that it will be easier for them to go through all the, the checkpoints. As for the uh, sanitation and cleaning materials that we need for the sites, uh, SKF uh, Corporate also, through our procurement uh, department, also help out in sourcing out this uh, needed uh, sanitation and uh, cleaning materials. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the COVID safety protocols and procedures that uh, uh, some of the measures will be taken up in some of the properties we're managing. So one is the temperature, checking of all entrances, and then uh, disinfection of all uh, incoming uh, vehicles. Also the health declaration checklist for returning tenants and employees after the ECQ. Uh, health questionnaires for the visitors. This is for, uh, for contact tracing. And then deep cleaning and sanitation.
sanitation of common areas. Um, when we do the deep cleaning and sanitation of common areas, uh, we, we don't just focus on the common areas, no? but even all the limited common areas, including, um, I could say, uh, the barracks of uh, security and, uh, and the housekeeping. Because as you know, uh, these are the frontliners. And a lot of passive cases really are now with, um, with the security guards and the housekeepers. So it is very critical that we also um, conduct a sanitation disinfection uh, to uh, these uh, uh, limited area uh, spaces. And then also we installed uh, social distancing markings on common areas, particularly on the elevators and uh, even on the um, property management office. No? As you all know, property management office is the central uh, transaction area in all the buildings. So uh, it is very uh, crucial also that uh, there should be some uh, 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 social uh, distancing uh, markings and other reminders uh, for uh, uh, safety. And uh, reminders on the, the using of the face mask on all the properties that we are managing and uh, the prescribing of uh, PPEs uh, for all the staff, particularly uh, those who are working on the common areas and those who are working inside the units for uh, the bears. Um, as you all know, this, uh, this uh, COVID experience really, really um, you know, um, limit us no, in the in the face-to-face -face transactions with our clients. So what we did is uh, we use technology also. No? We have a PM uh, PM uh, software that uh, we are using in all the properties that we're managing uh, to conduct transactions. Um, email approvals also on uh, when it comes to the uh, work approvals and uh, uh, release of uh, passes. And uh, also uh, cash fees and sanctions in payment association dues, utility fees. And uh, currently we are now uh, working together with uh, some uh, uh, firms who are the experts when it comes to cash fees and sanctions so that we can really roll this out to all the other uh, property management, uh, uh, manage uh, uh, properties that we're, we're currently we're on. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to discuss you know, our occupancy strategies and operations uh, sustainability in all our managed sites. As, as I have mentioned earlier, we have provided uh, shuttle services and transportation uh, to all our uh, employees who are having a hard time uh, reporting to the site. And then also we uh, help out in the, the issuance of uh, access pass so that uh, they could be easily go through all the checkpoints. And then a uh, setting of our new rules for the common areas. Uh, specifically more on the uh, residential uh, uh, buildings that we are uh, managing right now. Um, we set up uh, new rules when it comes to the use of the function room of the uh, swimming pool, gyms, and amenities, uh, limiting the number of, uh, you know, the number of uh, people uh, using that, or totally um, uh, prohibiting the use uh, temporarily you know, because of this uh, COVID. And then also health questionnaires you know, to all the visitors uh, of uh, the sites that we're managing. Um, circulars and notices uh, for all the residents. Uh, we need to keep them uh, updated on all the um, uh, guidelines and policies uh, being, um, being raised by the IATF or uh, the community barangay level. And then deep cleaning and sanitation common areas now, especially on the touch points, on, the, uh, on, uh, on areas where there are a lot of uh, you know, traffic of people so those are the areas we really focus on when it comes to deep cleaning, sanitation, and, and uh, uh, deep cleaning and sanitation and disinfection. Um, Santos Night Frank is also providing this kind of uh, services. And then uh, we also require our, um, our staff, no, on-site staff uh, for rapid testing, uh, just to make sure that everything is, uh, everyone is safe. And, um, you know, in, in our, for discussion also with, uh, with other service providers, we are now also requiring them to do the same, just for the safety of uh, everyone. And uh, you know, this is kind of, this COVID experience really, uh, is really a challenge for all of us. So we also are taking a look at the, um, at the um, physical and the mental uh, uh, safety of all the employees. Currently we are, uh, we are, um, um, we're trying to, you know, to provide uh, uh, safety awareness uh, webinars through our health card provider. These are all for the uh, Santa's Night Traffic.
employees. And then uh, we also conducted checkups of uh, equipment uh, in the properties uh, uh, because of the, lo the long absence uh, due to the ECQ, due to the, to the long shutdown. So we really need to really uh, make sure that uh, all uh, equipments are functional. And then coming to the new normal, um, we are working with several uh, uh, <clears throat> partnerships also to provide us the new building technologies that would really help us uh, you know, to operate and sustain operations, so particularly on cashless transactions and contactless uh, solutions. Um, next slide, please. So what is the future of uh, property management in the Philippines? You know, well, this uh, COVID-19 experience uh, uh, really emphasized the need for building resiliency and uh, professional property uh, management. Um, property management uh, services is not uh, pandemic proof. However, uh, it could be resilient. And um, the only opportunity here is really to provide the um, uh, best uh, uh, service delivery. Uh, services will be the same. However, it will uh, evolve. Um, property management is no longer just the usual, uh, you know, security and uh, janitorial and uh, maintenance. No? But um, there's more element of, um, of uh, safety and uh, sanitation and uh, the quality of air um, um, and the use of technology, in the particularly on cashless and suctions and the uh, solutions. Uh, I, I could say that uh, it is more now of a total wellness of a building. There are two areas of uh, changes now in property management. Um, one is the environmental and the other one is uh, behavioral. When we say environmental, this is more on the, um, on the kind of the building that, you know, that we develop on the spaces. Um, and the other one is the behavioral. I think uh, it is uh, now responsibility of our property management uh, firms really to, you know, to come up with the procedures and systems that will uh, definitely influence and uh, shape up uh, the, um, the behavior of uh, people working and uh, living on, on the buildings so that they can uh, easily adapt uh, to the new uh, normal. Uh, so uh, uh, that will be my presentation for today. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, back thank, to you, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Excellent presentation, and um, thank you for all your hard work. And uh, you know, and hats off to you know being on the front line during the crisis and being on call in to the critical industries, to the the hospitals, and to to the twenty four seven BPOs and telecoms. So, kudos to you and your team, and uh, for, uh, for for uh, for all you do twenty four seven. Our next speaker is Curvilla Abraham the Senior Executive Director for Property Management of Knight Frank Malaysia. Kuru has over 30 years of high caliber experience in Malaysia, Qatar, and the United Kingdom. He has provided outstanding services to developers, multinationals, public and private companies, real estate investment trusts, REITs, and also fund managers. Kuru's team manage millions of, of, of square feet throughout Malaysia, and they are the leading property management FM service provider in, in Malaysia, including such assets as Estaka in Johor Bahru, the tallest twin tower condominium in Southeast Asia, KL Eco City, a 1.2 million square foot mixed use development, uh, and more than 5 million square feet of real estate investment trust properties. Kura also manages properties on behalf of Citibank, Prudential, Manulife and AIA Cap Square. Among his cr credentials, uh, he has an honors degree in estate management from Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, Scotland. He is a member of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors in the UK, among many other prof professional affiliations and qualifications. Once again, thank you for joining us today. Here, and now let's hear from Kuru the Guru. Thank you very much, uh, Rick. Can uh, everyone hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay, great. All right, good morning and uh, selamat pagi, as we say in Malaysia. Good morning. Uh, firstly, I want to uh, convey my sincere thanks and appreciation to Santos Knight Frank 
for this kind invitation to me uh, in order for me to share our experience in Malaysia during this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, we are, ladies and gentlemen, in unprecedented times. And Malaysia, um, like many nations in the world, started our lockdown on the 18th of March, uh, 2020. And this period, um, which was called the Movement Control Order, or MCO, started from 18 March and went up to the 3rd of May. Uh, the MCO was further uh, extended uh, under the Conditional Movement Control Order, which is called the CMCO, and that went on from 4th of May to 9th of June. We are right now in what we call the RMCO, which is a recovery movement control order period, which is due right now to end on 31st August uh, of uh, 2020. Now, uh, the number of COVID cases in Malaysia has been in the recent days averaging between 10 and 15 persons. So that's kind of good news for us uh, in the nation. And generally it has been concentrated in a few clusters and uh, from imported cases uh, from Malaysians who are returning back uh, from abroad. Uh, our total death toll to date is about 125. And I believe yesterday we only had 11 cases, uh, new cases again, concentrated in certain clusters. Now throughout the uh, movement control order, property managers and management service was deemed as an essential service. And therefore our management buildings were all opened. Uh, our site teams were uh, working uh, full hours because we had tenants who were deemed as part of essential service, particularly uh, banking and financial institutions. So our team still had to be on site. They work right through the MCO, the CMCO, and even through the RMCO. And, and since then, since the 4th of May, we've been back uh, in full force in all, all our buildings. And uh, Today, uh, I want to quickly just share some of the best practice measures that Night Frank Malaysia uh, undertook during the movement control order. And I want to break it down into uh, the three main uh, asset classes that we have, which is the commercial offices, the malls, and the residential developments, which are under our management. Now, uh, what I'm going to share, it's, it's, I, I don't think you're going to see very much difference what been done in the Philippines and other parts of the world, because it is something new for, for very many countries and very many of the property managers. Uh, and uh, we were able to share some of these uh, best practices with our colleagues throughout the Knight Frank family, uh, right from the United States to New Zealand and every country we used to meet every fortnight to share some of the best practices and, and see uh, some of the uh, uh, things which were working so that we could push it uh, forward. So firstly, I want to share about some of the measures we took in our offices, as you can see on the slide, there are three, the three uh, uh, periods of time that we had. Uh, so we started the whole uh, measurement uh, and the strict uh, SOPs even pre the MCO. When we heard uh, around the world that this virus was spreading, we started temperature screening for our visitors already prior to the kind of lockdown in Malaysia. Uh, and uh, even our service providers uh, were all expected to wear PPEs uh, face mask and we had social distancing. Uh, we already had our process in place that if somebody's temperature was above 37.5 uh, degrees C, um, they were not allowed into the building. They were asked to go to a clinic. We already had provided hand sanitizers and disinfection of buildings were already starting. Visitors had to fill a declaration form, especially if they've uh, traveled in from overseas and from countries where the pandemic was uh, quite serious, especially at that time. It was countries like China and Korea. Uh, and also we were continuously uh, sending out notices to all our, our tenants and our landlords and we're putting measures in place even pre uh, movement control order and throughout the MCO period. Can I have the next slide please? So once we went into what we call the uh, movement control order period and the CMCO and the RMCO period, um, that's, the, that's the time during the months of March and April where uh, uh, the number of cases in Malaysia really uh, increased. And that's when uh, the measures even got more stricter. And so wearing face masks was all compulsory. As I said, our buildings were not totally shut down. Um, we had essential services uh, still being provided within the building. So we still had to uh, entertain tenants who were coming in uh, and also occasional visitors. 
uh, one of the things we uh, started doing during the conditional movement uh, order and the RMCO is we we split our uh, side office team into two offices. This is something I really want to acknowledge a lot of our landlords and our clients um, because no building usually has two management offices and they, they agreed for us to split our team in order so that if, if one person is infected, we do not need to shut down the management office. So we, we had split the office, the management offices into two uh, in different parts of the building and they actually were both working at the same time and the same days, but they were totally isolated from each other. So it was part of our VCP and I'm very, very happy. A lot of our landlords agreed there was a cost because we had to build up another office, put in the IT uh, and all of that support. Um, but all of them um, supported us and uh, we, were managed, we managed to open two offices um, within each of our buildings. Um, <clears throat> that's obviously the limits to the number of people who could come into the building. There was uh, sanitizer and disinfection. Um, we had our housekeeping specialists who actually went in and looked at the, even the type of chemicals and the cleaning equipment that, uh, uh, and chemicals which were needed to, because it's not just any disinfectant, it had to be a specific type, which was uh, good for, for, for the cleaning. Um, <clears throat> recently, um, um, the government had come up with an app um, called MySajatra. You can see uh, the term there. And uh, basically, um, this is for contact tracing purposes. Um, so most of our buildings, if not all, we already had a visitor declaration. We already had an app, but now uh, we've added in the MySajatra app. So as people come in, uh, see, one of the things is obviously everyone's going to argue about is about convenience versus uh, health and safety. So whilst we have a visitor registration system in our buildings, there was obviously an added process where they actually had to write down their names, get their temperature checked and stuff. So we wanted to see how we could make it more co convenient. So we kind of uh, linked up uh, our visitor management system with the health declaration and the screening. Uh, and and uh, I'm pleased to say that generally there's been not much queues in our buildings. It's also not everyone has come back to work as such yet, uh, but everything's been managed well. And uh, we are able to, through the with the government uh, able to do contact tracing if there's any cases. Um, the building systems, and this was very important um, because um, um, not the entire buildings were uh, in operation. We had actually shut down some of our chillers, shut down some of our air handling units, uh, and shut down some of the key things two, for two reasons. One is we didn't want to waste energy, and secondly, it was also there to uh, uh, help uh, save the cost uh, because it was a very tough time for all of our clients and landlords and building owners as uh, a cost was running and they weren't, uh, there were requests for waivers in rental. So we had shut that, shut some of the things down, but as we went into the CMCO period and the RMCO period, um, we had to make sure that all of these systems were able to uh, start up again and run again. And so our engineering team went in one week before we op reopened the entire building and started up all our systems and, and thank God everything worked, uh, everything uh, started back up again and it was running very well. Um, we also trained our security uh, personnel and our site team on how to monitor and to follow and implement all the SOPs and guidelines on COVID-19. Uh, as Ed said as well, communication uh, was a very, very key uh, uh, part of the whole thing. And during the entire four, four and a half months of this lockdown, um, we had daily meetings um, and uh, uh, with the site side teams and with our clients and with landlords updating uh, uh, each one of them on, on what's happening and the measures that has been taken. Uh, also during the RMCO period, it became compulsory for all foreign workers who were working and specifically in the security and cleaning industries uh, for them to uh, take the uh, COVID-19 COVID test. And um, again, pleased to say uh, that was also completed and done and we've got no positive cases um, within our setup. Next slide, please. And uh, just going on to the malls itself. Again, uh, this was a challenging time for our, for our mall management team. Um, we obviously had to close down some of the entrances, uh, limit entrances to the mall. Uh, during the initial MCO period, uh, we actually had two of our malls which actually had to shut down totally. They were not even open because a lot of the tenants were not operating. 
uh, a couple more were uh, running. Uh, there were daily preventive measures of social distancing notices and sanitizers. Um, there was also a dedicated response team that we put in charge, uh, ready to react on any suspect cases, and they were they were there on 24 hours. We also implemented energy savings uh, initiatives. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, tough time for the landlord, so uh, we looked at energy savings, shutting down some of the m and &E equipment, uh, and only provided where absolutely necessary. And this helped, obviously, the, the utility expenses uh, for the mall. Um, SOPs were set up, as we said, as I said, it was unprecedented for all of us. Uh, that had to uh, be constantly reviewed and, and reviewed uh, from time to time. And uh, that was constantly changed and communicated to all stakeholders. Uh, online engagement, um, that was constant, giving all uh, mall visitors and tenants regular updates on uh, what's happening. Uh, and if there were some of the malls, uh, tenants who were operating, any promotions that were going on. We kept that communication going on as well. And uh, constant tenant management, looking at, uh, especially at this phase where we are in, uh, when would they be reopening their mall, uh, their, their shop, and when can we get them running in full steam as well. Can I have the next slide, please? This is going into uh, some of the measures that we uh, actually put in um, uh, right now, um, in, even in this time. So there's still temperature screening. This is the new normal. Uh, there are temperature screening for everyone. There is obviously the uh, MySajatra uh, contact tracing app. Uh, cleaning and sanitization, as Ed mentioned in the Philippines, is still going on very frequently in all our malls. Um, uh, replacement of uh, antimicrobial uh, microbial hand soaps in all toilets. Uh, hand sanitization placed at all lobbies, entrances, information counters. Uh, as Ed said, social distancing, stickers, notices all over the place, as I said. Communication was very keen, uh, very key in this whole thing. Uh, constant reminder, even on uh, through the PA announcements about people to keep their distances because it is a general excitement for people as things are opening up, as they come back, just to get back, they think things are back to normal, but it's not. Um, so we had to constantly and do constantly remind people about practicing social distancing or it's called physical distancing right now. Uh, lifts also, there are still limits in numbers of uh, number of passengers can access each lift, even toilets where there are smaller toilets, they're actually still shut um, and there are limited uh, entrance to toilets, again, practice social distancing. Uh, nursing rooms uh, in the malls are, are locked at this time and will be only open upon uh, request. And even our surahs, um, there's also limited persons allowed, again, with social distancing. Uh, for the tenants themselves, they are expected to conduct temperature uh, readings for uh, their staff twice a day. Uh, undertake frequent uh, sanitization of the uh, unit uh, to provide hand sanitization at the cash counter. Also to control the number of people who comes in to uh, their unit. Um, we don't, uh, the, the general guideline here is at least a one meter distance between uh, two persons. Um, they obviously have a work explanation uh, application um, and face-to-face uh, -face, uh, meetings are limited. We try to limit that as much as possible. Um, as uh, <clears throat> Ed mentioned about cashless, yeah, as we encourage uh, most of it through e-wallets uh, or uh, online payments uh, and discourage any over-the-counter payments. Um, and FNB uh, tenants are to arrange their tenants with social distancing, again, uh, with the one meter distancing as well. Going on to our uh, residential developments, next slide, please. Uh, again, they, uh, there were the, um, the, the, the three periods, as I mentioned, even like the offices, we started temperature screening even pre-18th uh, of March um, for the residents. Um, and uh, during the uh, MCO period, now this is mainly for um, uh, people who are actually coming in. The second slide is more on the facilities. Um, so we were, uh, during the MCO, no, uh, no one was allowed into the, uh, into the residential developments. Um, except for contractors or for special care or needs that are needed uh, for people living within the condo. So no visitors were allowed at all. Um, and uh, only essential and critical services were allowed, security, cleaning, rubbish, disposal, pest control, they were allowed. And it was mandatory to wear a mask at all times when you're moving. Even our management office uh, was, was uh, we had people in there, but it was closed. 
there was no direct contact. Um, and during the current period, um, we uh, still encourage the use of PPE, body temperature screening, and the e-form registration, uh, QR code, and health declaration still in place. Uh, service providers also uh, allowed now, and, and COVID tests, as I mentioned earlier, it's compulsory for all foreign workers. And practice social distancing uh, is still there within all our uh, within all our residential developments. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. And basically, the common property, um, all the facilities were shut, uh, as it was in every part of the world. There was no swimming pools which were open, no gyms, no saunas. Everything was shut. Um, we are in the phase right now where things are slowly uh, uh, coming back, uh, and we are opening our, our pools and gyms back in again. But again, with strict SOPs and guidelines, in uh, it's uh, a bit strange that you had practice social distancing in a pool as well. So uh, we have those those guidelines and rules uh, for this, and a maximum number of persons who can be uh, in a swimming pool at any one time. Uh, the kids' pools are still closed. Um, uh, gyms are still allowed. Again, maximum number of people, depending again the number or, or the size of the gym. Um, so uh, you can see on the right side, we are at that stage right now. Um, all of the sporting, recreational, renovation works, leasing activities are all allowed um, with conditions and obviously in compliance with the full uh, SOP that is, uh, that is in place. Um, and again, uh, earlier we had, as I mentioned, the two site teams. Right now, they are fully back in, in force in all our residential developments. So as I end this, uh, I just want to leave um, uh, all of you with uh, some of the uh, things to for us as, as property managers and as um, people uh, going through this pandemic. Um, I think we, we, we're going to see in the future and from now on um, that health and safety is going to be a major priority. It was always there within property management, but I think it's going to go up uh, in the list of uh, priority items with landlords, with tenants looking for space, uh, and in the budgets that we will soon all be working on uh, as we come towards the end of another year and moving into 2021. Uh, contactless technology is going to be very high in all uh, uh, CAPEX uh, and, and building improvements. We're going to see a lot of that coming because that's what tenants are requiring uh, as, they, as they look for space as well. And communication. I think the whole success uh, and one of the reasons why I, I see a lot of building owners being happy with property managers is because of the regular communication. Everyone was leaving, living in an unknown time um, and with constant communication, there was reassurances given, the measures which were taken. We, 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 we were transparent in the entire communication. Uh, even if there was one case, we did inform all the residents and there was the whole SOP uh, taking place. I think during the entire um, four and a half months, we, we had about eight cases uh, in all our uh, 25 million square feet that we manage. Uh, and all that's been uh, totally clear. In fact, all of those eight cases never even came into the building. They were just recorded as people who lived or worked uh, in that residence. But all of that was communicated. So transparent co uh, communication was very important and that was very much appreciated by everyone involved. And uh, as we say in property, it's always about location, location, location. But during this time as property managers, I say comply, comply, comply. If we want to get uh, get back to where we are, if we can, it's just complying totally to the SOPs and hearing. And this is where as property managers, we have a big role to make sure that compliance is in, in, in full effect. And just want to leave you, all of you all with two things. One is stay safe, stay healthy. And it's all our collective responsibility to ensure that we can carry on. And as Rick said, we all want to get back to the office and get back to near normal as we can as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Kuru, thank you for your excellent presentation. And just, just, just a real quick question. One is a lot of changes. Do you think these changes are permanent? And then how has the COVID situation changed the perspectives of landlords with regards to property management? Yeah, I, I, I think um, you will see, I'll answer your second question first. Uh, as mentioned, we are unprecedented times and every measure that we take is actually kind of a test, but in compliance with what the authorities and, and government SOPs. But my personal view is that I think until a vaccine is found, 
and until this virus is eradicated, we will carry on with these measures. It may be some relaxation uh, depending on the number of cases that we have in the country. But we can see, uh, even in our own building, as I come to work every day, we can see people generally getting used to the new normal, to the new measures, uh, and everyone is concerned about uh, complying with health and safety uh, SOP. So, yeah, to answer your second question, yes, I think it, we will see this for, for some time uh, going forward as well. And to your first question, yeah, health and safety has always been an integral part of property management and it's uh, best practice, whether it was uh, during COVID or even prior to COVID. I believe, uh, as I mentioned, we will see a greater emphasis on, on, on HS, HSSE measures uh, in our buildings, especially both for uh, new tenants and for our sitting tenants, because they would demand uh, greater emphasis on this. And landlords and uh, property managers, I think, as we as I mentioned, as we now sit down in the in the in the coming months in the budgets, looking at uh, at maybe the capex capital expenditure, we will be looking at how we can incorporate a lot of the health and safety measures, such as contactless facilities and technology, uh, into uh, our day-to-day -day operations as well. Thank you, Kuru. Excellent presentation, and uh, no doubt people will have more questions later on. Please feel free to email us with regards to systems, processes, uh, QR codes, and the Knight Frank systems, and uh, we'd be delighted, delighted to uh, to follow up on those after the session. So, um, moving on to once again, thank thanks again, uh, Kuru and uh, Knight Frank Malaysia. Now let's hear this perspective of the Filipino Institute of Real Property Managers Administrators through its president, Nestor Correa. Nestor is the president and general manager of NetScore Resource Management and Training Center Corporation, a PRC accredited continuing professional educator and provider. He's also the president of the Philippine Association of, of Real Estate Boards of Mandaluyong City. Welcome, Nestor, and thank you, Nestor, so much for joining us today. Yeah, good morning, Rick. Good morning to all the participants, no? both here in Malaysia, in the Philippines, and uh, uh, all over the world who are watching right now. It's uh, I know we're very grateful for uh, having been, inv been invited to this uh, very uh, uh, exciting uh, discussion on the uh, very relevant topic. Okay, so um, uh, just to give an introduction, the uh, Filipino Institute of Real Property Managers and Administrators Incorporated is a very young uh, organization. We, uh, we, we've only been incorporated uh, in 2018, uh, but at that time uh, we were uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, most of the properties here in the Philippines are not uh, professionally managed, and uh, recognizing that, so we, we went into uh, uh, a rapid education program wherein we can convert uh, uh, young graduates into uh, uh, competent professional managers. So. That's a uh, that's a time when uh, when uh, this uh, pandemic hit, uh, we were uh, uh, not quite ready yet, but uh, uh, we did our best no? uh, with our, uh, limited resources and limited uh, um, membership that we have. At the time, uh, at the February of this year, we only have about close two hundred to two hundred fifty members. No? Uh, considering that uh, the number of practitioners here are about 2,000 or 2,200. So uh, we're just above the 10% uh, level. Uh, and then um, we were caught by surprise because uh, we were monitoring the pandemic uh, as early as February. But uh, as of early March, there's no, uh, there were zero cases in the Philippines. But once uh, is, is, we heard, yes, yeah, 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 Nestor, yeah. Uh, just you know, how did firm uh, and its members react to the pandemic, and what are some of the initiatives taken by the organization to help its members to to deal with the situation? Well, uh, uh, it was uh, the lockdown uh, was in March 18, and we just had our meeting on March 16, the board meeting, where we were discussing with. Uh, uh, one of the major uh, hygiene products uh, uh, manufacturer here in the Philippines. And uh, uh, we were uh, caught by surprise because uh, we only have one day to mobilize our uh, staff 
and inform uh, our members on what to do uh, with this particular lockdown. So what happened was uh, the night before, uh, FIRMA sounded up all its members to go on crisis management mode okay, and apply the emergency uh, management protocols uh, that they have learned you know, during one, of, uh, one or two of our certification courses. And then we made calls uh, for property, uh, property managers because we're, we're, we've been receiving calls that uh, uh, tenants were uh, asking uh, instructions uh, from security guards because there's no uh, property manager on hand. So we, uh, we made calls no, for PMs. But uh, uh, luckily, um, PMs then were not recognized as essential workers. So they are not authorized uh, persons no, to, uh, to go outside or the APOR. So uh, we wrote a letter to the uh, IATF asking for exemptions no, to the travel ban and for property management practitioners uh, to be classified as essential workers. So uh, eventually, um, the DTI classified us as a, uh, our maintenance and security staff were classified as category one, while uh, property managers as well as uh, leasing managers and our resident managers and staff were classified as category two. Uh, from that moment, we referenced best practices from uh, uh, countries that have initially shown a significant success in handling COVID-19. And this includes uh, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, Japan, South Korea. Uh, and also we uh, reference uh, guidance from uh, USCDC, you know, Center for Disease Control. And then a few days later, uh, we held our first online meeting and came out with our FIRMA guidelines and protocols in combating uh, COVID-19. So uh, later on, uh, because as this uh, virus is uh, evolving and uh, the epidemiologists have been uh, uh, revising their uh, initial guidelines, so we have also to revise our uh, guidelines. No? Um, then in our monthly uh, membership meetings uh, that are held online, uh, we started inviting uh, resource persons on relevant topics, uh, such as uh, adapting new technologies to combat the spread of the pandemic, and uh, also uh, in improving indoor air quality in our managed buildings. So, okay, we also have guested in radio programs, as well as online business fora to discuss uh, new property management initiatives, as well as answer uh, questions regarding issues pertaining to COVID-19, the, protocol, the protocols that are in place, and uh, what health standards should we reference. Okay. Now, um, I think uh, we have been successful in that uh, aspect, and, uh, but still, uh, um, because uh, this is an unprecedented event, uh, I stay, uh, we still are on our toes no, on how we could uh, improve further our services, and as well as uh, minimize the risk, you know, uh, so that uh, our uh, tenants, occupiers, uh, owners, landlords will have that confidence to continue on with their business. Okay. Back to you, Rick. Now, yeah, so Nestor, what do you think is the greatest impact of COVID-19 uh, on the property management industry as a whole? Well, I think the greatest, the greatest impact of this pandemic uh, is that people have come, become more conscious of their health and uh, they've been uh, more choosy in the environment uh, that they live in. You know? So during the last three months, or, or, or we're going to the fourth month right now, no? uh, I mean in Metro Manila, no? so people have realized that the, their cramped living spaces have been becoming uh, virtual prison cells no, for them. And even for those who are, have the privilege uh, uh, to live in luxury apartments, they would want to trade their gilded cages for more uh, outdoor spaces. So I think for the next uh, few years, because uh, we expect this to last for about two or three years, there might be a significant uh, population shift no, from uh, central business districts to suburbs no, because of the changing uh, locational preference of people. So uh, the less travel will uh, greatly impact the hospitality industry. And for this sector, sector I think uh, recovery will be uh, quite slow. So, And then in the near... Uh, future, no? in the following months, we expect a lot of business closures, particularly on uh, the restaurants, uh, leisure, entertainment, uh, MICE uh, events industry. No? And uh, we see, as, in, uh, as we have already seen no? in other countries, a lot of foreclosures, loan defaults, bankruptcies, 
uh, as soon as the uh, second wave no uh, will uh, uh, further unfolds so i i think uh, we have to brace ourselves no, for uh, this second wave and uh, i hopefully that there won't be a third wave okay yeah, yeah Nestor, learning from the COVID-19 experience, what areas do you think property managers should give the most attention to as far as property management is concerned? Well, uh, uh, previously, we are uh, more engrossed on uh, value enhancement and, of course, uh, the profit aspect of managing properties or the income-producing properties. Now, but uh, COVID-19 reminded us of our core duties to our tenants and occupiers, and these are what? To keep them safe and secure, and second, to deliver the highest level of comfort, comfort possible. You no, know? but then as we went into GCQ and the government had eased uh, the travel restrictions and allowed more industries to open, we uh, encourage our members and followers to apply the highest achievable health standards or safety standards instead of uh, sticking to the minimum safety requirements of the government. So we we felt that. Uh, uh, to minimize the uh, health risk, you know, then we have to apply uh, steps are that are two or three steps ahead you know, of what is uh, prescribed in the minimum uh, safety requirements given by government. So we have been talking to leaders of uh, the uh, HVAC industry, the IT industry, lighting industry, uh, because uh, uh, if you notice lately, uh, UBC lamps are being uh, are pro uh, proliferating in the market. You know? And uh, also with the hygiene, uh, hygiene industries, huh? the uh, producers, the manufacturers of uh, um, face mask, alcohol, uh, disinfectants, huh? uh, and uh, we are, with these industries, we are we are trying to explore ways where we can all uh, collaborate and keep our homes and offices and industrial environments safe. Now, as for the comfort, we might not be able to deliver the same levels of comfort as before but we strive to make the situation more bearable for our occupiers. So one area that we are focused on at the moment is airflow management. Now, uh, this used to be formerly confined, or it's, uh, it's a specialization for particular property managers. These were formerly confined to medical facilities, uh, used, applied in uh, ICUs, you know, in operating rooms. Also for the uh, semiconductor industry, or where they have to have super clean rooms no? and other data centers. So we are discussing and exploring ways uh, so we, uh, we can use these technologies uh, like uh, negative pressure rooms, super clean rooms, no? and UBC uh, lamps no? in our managed properties at substantially reduced cost. No? Because we ha it has to be substantially reduced. Uh, because uh, through experience, no, we, while talking to one of the manufacturers, to convert a 100 uh, square meter um, room into a super clean room, you have to spend half a million pesos. So, uh, of course, uh, restaurant owners are already uh, in cri uh, financial crisis right now, and they don't have the resources to invest on another half a million pesos. So. So, uh, in fact, there are... Uh, no, yeah. no we, we, we hear you. And, and it's, you know, trying to find a cost-effective solution. So, yes. there's some, some excellent input there on clean rooms and the juxt yeah. juxtaposition with air quality, what we're experiencing now. So, final question. How do you see property management after this global pandemic? And this will this, oh, this remote management, such as work from home, be as effective as how we worked prior to the pandemic? Well, uh, history has been a uh, witness no, to the rise of property management expertise and excellence during uh, times of crisis. No? Uh, as we earlier said, the situation right now is unprecedented. And I was asked during a radio program whether I believe there will be a V-shaped economy. I honestly said that uh, we are currently experiencing something like the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 and the Great Depression of uh, 1930s combined. No? So, uh, I told them, expect a slow recovery. But we in the property management industry always strive during these periods of crisis. So if you notice, uh, after the Great Depression, uh, pro uh, property managers were in uh, instrumental in keeping distressed properties in top shape until they were uh, eventually uh, disposed of the profit. So we are masters of repurposing properties whose... Uh, viability have suffered during this pandemic. So our creative juices now flow out during these times. So in the end, 
uh, property managers, I believe, will overcome the challenges and turn this uh, into opportunities. Now, uh, will the work from home arrangement be as effective? Well, uh, we don't know how things will unfold in the next couple of months. As we said earlier, man is a social animal and the fact that uh, this has already resulted to a lot of uh, stress-related behavior due to prolonged uh, isolation. Um, uh, different individuals respond at different levels to this uh, of adaptation and coping in these situations. No? But one thing is sure, even if people work from home or other socially distanced working arrangements, firma members as well as uh, property managers generally will be there to keep them safe and comfortable in their chosen environment. Now that's 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 some great advice uh, and much appreciated. And I think the now more than ever, a lot of people that own these very expensive office buildings, residential buildings, mixed use centers, and say, hey, "Listen, I got to focus on the assets I've got, preserving those and getting liquidity yeah. out of those." So, thank mm -hmm. you so much, Nestor. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Kuru, for that insightful discussion. Welcome we'll on. now open the floor to questions from the audience. To moderate this session, may I call on Cash Salvador, our Associate Director for Investment and Capital Markets, Santos Knight Frank. Cash, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we've been getting a lot of questions today. Um, a lot of people are really interested in how, how has the Philippines has handled property management for COVID-19. And I think um, I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to weed out some of the questions. So I think um, first question is, it goes to Kuru. Um, Marlon Bautista is asking your situation. You mentioned earlier that you had two offices so that you can prevent the, the, the spreading of the virus. Um, he's asking, how was your experience in doing this and was it costly to do so? Uh, so no, um, the experience was quite um, straightforward uh, because we had uh, additional space within the building where we could uh, quickly uh, set up a, a second management office. Uh, it wasn't much cost other than um, just getting internet facilities and, uh, uh, you know, because all the staff obviously had their own laptops and stuff. And it's only for photocopying and rapographic stuff that we, we had some uh, issues. But other than that, uh, not very much cost uh, was involved, but extremely effective. Uh, it ran very effectively over the period. Yeah. I think Marlon is also, you know, toying with the idea of having the two offices that you mentioned. Yeah, um, it, it's a good thing so that you don't have your entire site team down. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if, if there's one suspected case, you have to close the entire office. So by splitting the teams, uh, you at least have half the team able to carry on. Okay, thanks for that, Puru. Um, I think, um, Ed, uh, there's a question that you can answer. Um, Laurit Shin is asking, um, what are the best practices to allow residents to use community amenities, such as the gym, swimming pool, and jogging path amidst of COVID-19? I think probably she's interested in, um, in, in allowing people already to use these facilities and amenities. Well, um, I, 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 well, I guess it's a matter of just scheduling, scheduling the, you know, the use of uh, the amenities when it comes to yeah, the swimming pool, and the function room and the gym, and also limiting the number of people who are going to use uh, those facilities. Um, yeah, um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, condominiums really uh, prohibits the use of these amenities uh, during the pandemic. However, of course, these are amenities to be enjoyed by the by the residents. So it's just a matter of scheduling and uh, limiting the number of people who are going to use it. Of course, it should conform with the uh, community guidelines and uh, ruling. Uh, you know, if the government's telling us. Uh, comply the mission so that's all well just i think this is more of me adding to that question um was there an experience that there was a like a coding for units odd units number odd number of units will be going on like will be allowed on oh, these yeah days? actually yeah that, that's a good uh, idea maybe you can they can do that also as long as uh, uh you know it will limit the number of people like, using uh, cell facilities thank you for that ed um, I think uh, Sir Nestor um, Arvin Habon um, would like to ask that um, what are the current steps is the Philippines taking to keep up with countries such as Singapore and Malaysia on managing properties? Mm, well, uh, Firma right now is uh, trying to uh, upgrade no, the standards no, and practices here in the Philippines to conform with uh, the global standards. No? Set by uh, associations like uh, IPMA, IREM, no, 
and other uh, associations in other countries. In fact, we're also a member of the PIABC, no? the International Real Estate Federation, where we are also in contact with IREM and uh, IPMA. No? So, and also we are a member, uh, as, a, as a realtor, as a broker, we're, uh, and being a, a past president of uh, Pareb Mandaluyo, we have close contacts with our ASEAN brothers no? uh, through the ASEAN Real Estate Alliance, uh, Network Alliance. And we do uh, exchange uh, uh, no, no, best practices from these countries, and that includes all 10 ASEAN countries. Now, uh, our, our main trust now is in educating uh, uh, property managers and producing uh, professional property, property practitioners. So right now we have a four-part program. We start with the level one, which is leasing, uh, leasing ma lease management. Second is uh, property administration. Level three is facilities management. And the uh, final uh, level is uh, professional uh, property management. Now there's another, uh, uh, in the pipeline, there's another level, which is uh, asset management. That's level five. Okay. Thank yeah. you for that, Sir Nestor. Yes. Um, I think we have another question here. Um, I think uh, regarding uh, this question is addressed directly to Kuru. Um, Kuru Gail Umahag is actually asking, he, she would like to know um, more about the My Sehat Sejatera QR code system being implemented as mentioned in your slides. I think, I think that is something that is very interesting to, to know more about. Yeah. Um... Basically, this is, a, this is an app um, which has been uh, produced by the government uh, purely for contact tracing. So if a particular person is uh, uh, tested positive um, through this app, we are able to find out where all this person has been and who are the persons that he's been in, uh, in, in contact with. Um, it's very easy for uh, anyone to download um, the uh, app from the government's website. Uh, you can register your building uh, in that website and then they will generate a QR code which you can print and then you can laminate it and stick it up at all the key entrances. And people, uh, people like you and me, we can just download, uh, download the app either from Google Play or App Store uh, and you have the app. And the first time you register, they would ask you all the specific details, your name, your mobile number and all of that. And once you have that, you get the app on your phone. And as you enter into the buildings, wherever they have the QR code, just scan it with that app and you're in. So it makes the whole process of checking in uh, a lot faster, a lot quicker, and achieving uh, the uh, information that uh, the government and everyone needs for contact tracing. Thanks for that, Kuru. I think we have so many questions, but I think, um, well, let's, let's tackle one more. Um, Ed, I think this question you can answer. Um, Nick Ramos is asking, um, what is your best advice for building owners today? Well, uh, uh, for the building owners, uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, <clears throat> high time that you really uh, consider uh, getting uh, professional property management uh, services. Simply because, uh, um, you know, most building owners have, have their own um, you know, business owners also, you know, uh, leaving the headaches of uh, managing uh, uh, the daily operations of the building to, let's say, to the, uh, you know, to the, to the experts in property management. But then again, um, uh, it, it, it's all about, there should be continuity of operations on all the building, uh, uh, on the building services. So there should be also, uh, um, um, let's say, a continuity, you know, um, a synergy between all the uh, service providers that you're hiding, particularly the property management, the security, and uh, the maintenance, uh, uh, so that um, uh, everything will be taken care of, you know. Uh, and it could only be done by uh, by, uh, property, by professional property management services. Thanks for that, awesome. Ed. Um, I guess um, just to wrap up, uh, property management is really our unsung heroes. Um, they are our frontliners now who are taking care of us in our, whether in your condo or in your office, in the mall, everywhere. Everywhere you go, property management is the one that is implementing these rules and taking care of us so that we will stay safe um, and, you know, keep battling this COVID-19. Um, I think we will be answering all the questions that you sent over. We'll be sending them through email. We'll, we'll get in uh, touch with all those people who have sent their questions over. 
Um, but as of now, I'll turn it over back to Rick. Yeah, thank you. Uh, th thank you, Cash. Thanks so much for that excellent panel discussion. That was, uh, that was fantastic. And also thanks again uh, to our panelists, uh, Nestor and Ed and, and, and Kuru. Um, and thank you once again to our partners, uh, ULI uh, Philippines and Firma, speakers, panels for insights this morning. Um, clearly with property management, um, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't go to a doctor, you wouldn't go to a hospital and not ask for a specialist in an area. So within the real estate field, property, facilities, asset management are very specialist fields to get professionals who've been doing that for 20 plus years. It is detailed work. They're, they're looking after some of the most valuable assets you have in your company and also very, very the most valuable assets you probably have in your family businesses. So get the professionals in there. It's tough work. It's, uh, it's unsung hero work but it's hugely, uh, it's hugely necessary. And uh, as, as times get, get, get tougher, and they will get a bit tougher, make sure you got property management professionals in place. <laughs>